Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me at the Botanical Society's webinar for August. I'm uh, happy to be co-hosting with Rupert for the next two months, um, definitely bringing more of the gardening horticulture side into it. And he, of course, brings this wonderful con conservation uh, side to it. And in order to celebrate spring, I have two presenters that I have invited to talk about their areas of passion. And our first presenter this evening is Eugene Marinas from Huntum Botanical Garden, although he was the curator there for over 15 years. He's moved on just like I have to grow and to enjoy and to know flowers in his own area of expertise. And today his title is Between the Daisies. And we're always looking at the daisies. Eugene is going to unfurl what he finds between them and share his passion and his knowledge with us. So Eugene, welcome. Welcome everybody. Enjoy. Here we go, Eugene Marinas, superstar of the West Coast. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Elise, and um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to speak about the blooming secrets between the daisies. And um, specifically, people usually want to see rolling hills of um, carpets and carpets of daisies. And uh, that is what people are used to when they hear West Coast on the Macquarie. And um, today I'm going to take you in between the daisies, but I'm also going to I'm not going to tell you where to go, the best places to visit, where the flowers are peaking at the moment, although I'll say a bit of the, of the inside info. Um, but just um, for the purposes of the, oh, yeah, um, when, when you go flower hunting, um, some very, very good tips or advice is to phone or visit the local info offices. Locals knows best. Book a local guide or book a tour. Um, most people go into the West Coast or the Macquarie during um, flower season. They go in with this misconception that they will just see carpets and carpets of daisies. And this year in particular is a very, very special year. Uh, there were um, lots of early rains and lots of follow up. And over the, the West Coast and parts of the Macquarie, it might be raining at the moment. And that also means that the flower season will be prolonged. So what people usually want to see, this photograph, what courtesy of the Macro Tours, is was taken on the 29th of August, just um, two days ago. And most people want to see that. They want to see carpets and carpets of daisies, um, similarly to the second photograph. And um, if you go, to, go a little bit further north, up to Nivelbrook, where my actual expertise lies, um, you can, in some areas, the diversity is so high that you can get 15 to 20 different plant species in one square meter. So my tip to you would be, get out of your car, go and walk. Go and see those exceptional species in between. But I know people want to see mass display of daisies or whatever, but mass display. So if you go to Nivelville, this picture was taken about a week ago. Um, that was of a very special bulbanella, the orange bulbanella. And there's a combination of orange and yellow and orange bulbanellas. This photograph was um, taken at the Botanical Gardens. You can only visit that area if you go on a special tour at the Botanical Gardens. And then the next photograph is with courtesy of uh, Mandy Kotzer. This was taken yesterday. Um, at the moment, Nivelville is reaching its peak because Nivelville is also known as the bulk capital of the world. So when all the daisies and everything on the west coast and that are sort of dimming down, then Nivelville goes into a peak with their bulb, bulb species. So then if you also visit the area, look for the individual brilliance like this um, um, Esperanza vaginata. And some people usually miss them if they're not in mass display, because they're not in mass display every year. Sometimes you actually need to look for them. And also this Ferraria from the West Coast. If you, if you don't look carefully, you will miss these spectacular species. And then also 
Um, one of my favorites is the scrofulaviaceae, like this Elenzoa. I will tell you a bit more about this specific species um, further in my slide, but um, it looks like a very, very um, funny face and it is very, very intriguing, intriguing and it's got a very special pollinator that pollinates it. Um, then there's also species that display different colors over the range of, of their distribution. Uh, particularly this one, Sparexis elegans. It's a widely cultivated um, species, but it's actually endemic from the Liverpool area. And it distributes through the town of Liverpool, uh, north to south. And if you go further north, you can get a sort of a deep orange color without any markings on it. And <clears throat> if you go further south, it can change. And you can see in the photographs that it becomes a bit lighter. And then the markings inside is also more prominent. And if you go further south, you can even get a white form of it. And there's a photograph of a white and the mauve one next to each other. So there's a, a lot of variation. And if you think you've seen it all, you need to go in between the bushes, in between the daisies, and check um, what you've missed there. Because I've had tour groups coming into the botanical gardens in a bus. They sit in the bus. They just go click, 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 click turn around the bus at the parking and out they go and they think they've seen it all so um over the years I've, I've actually become a bit um sort of fascinated by all the pollinators and i've um looked at the different pollinators on the different flowers and i've come to the conclusion that you actually need the right tool for the right job because all those plants, everything that comes out of the mass needs to be pollinated. They have one mission, and that's to be pollinated to ensure that they've got a, a seed um, bank under the ground. So in, in the years that there's no, not enough rain, that they can lie in the dormant in the seed bank and um, come out when conditions are right. So I've, I'm actually very fascinated by um, pollinators and I've started photographing pollinators. Uh, they're not as easy as plants because they don't sit still. They move around and if you have to be at the right place at the right moment. So um, there's some of my photographs that I've taken over the years and it's really just so fascinating. If you can just stop for a moment, observe the plants, look at what pollinates them because that's also very, very important. Because without the pollinator, there won't be any flowers. So some of them, as this butterfly here, you can see the, the tongue in front. If it didn't have the right tool, it wouldn't be able to suck out the nectar from the bottom of this oxalis. And then also this very, very special um, fly. If you look at the, the, the length of the tongue of that fly, but, but it's also the same length as the tube of the flower. So they have sort of co-evolved, but I'll also explain a bit more about the fly further in my presentation. So, <clears throat> so some of the, the plants, also they flat on the ground and they also need a very specialized pollinator. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of this particular pollinator on the plant, but this is actually pollinated by mice they flat on the ground and they've got a very sugary sort of reward for the for the mice and this is a amazonia um flat on the ground it's one of the early flowers but um very very specialized and then there's also this dobenia they just about past the the peak and they're also pollinated by mice and they're very specific there are some other opportunistic pollinators that will visit them, but they're very specialized in who they want them to, to pollinate them. And then also this colticum, another one that's pollinated by mice, flat on the ground, and this one's got a very, very bright um, color also. And then just some um, advertising. Um, some of the um, people um, visit the area and they 
they think, okay, what else is there to do if, apart from um, looking at the flowers? So the West Doe and the Maculent is very, very rich in culture. And there's also a few other things that you can check out on the different websites or phone the number below, um, like the mountain bike and um, um, trail run. And there's also a picnic um, at Kravar on, on the Sunday coming. And then currently, the Clan William Wildflowers Doe is running daily from 8.30 to 6.30. So please, please make a, a note of it to visit there. That's been a highlight over the years that I visited and really worthwhile visiting. And then there's also the <coughs> Darling Wildflower Show that will start on the 15th um, and end on the 17th of September um, from 9 to 2 daily. Um, and a special save the date for the Viscous France outing to the Darling Flower Show on the, on the 17th. Um, they will be meeting at the museum at the entrance at 10 a.m. And it's sponsored for, for members um, to enter. And then coming back to this little Alizoa, um, this is one of the, 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 the species that really is really fascinating. If you look closely at the flower, um, the bottom part of the flower is like a cylinder, and the pollen presenters is actually at the bottom. So the area around Beaverville or the rest of the Maculene is a very hot, hot spot for a lot of plant species, but it's also a hot, hot spot for bee diversity and specifically solitary bee diversity. So this particular one is pollinated by a um, solitary bee called Redaviva. Ellen Zoi. It's so specific to the species. It's um, that it's actually named after the species. So what happens here is that the, the bee actually comes, sit on the, the flower, and the abdomen fits in perfectly at the bottom to get to the pollen presenters. And the pollen actually goes on the abdomen, and that is how it's transferred and moves on to the next flower. And then there's a, a whole lot of diaceas with different spur lengths, like this one, Diasia louisiae. This one you usually only see when you have early winter rain, and it's only known from a, a few populations scattered around Nivelville. And um, these slides are specifically to show you the spur lengths. Um, um, the louisiae don't have uh, a spur at all, and then the Veronicoides have a sort of a medium sized spur. And yeah, if you love it, sometimes you take a photograph, and later at night you see, you know, it resembles a little face or something. Um, yeah, but then you also get the other diaceas like Diasia floribunda. Um, this one's got a slightly longer um, spur, and the reason for that is because these species have co-evolved with the red viva bees. And in the photographs, you'll see the front legs is from small to medium to very long. So these, these um, pollinators and plant species have actually co-evolved over the years. And all these photographs and information that I'm sharing, uh, it's courtesy of Dr. Michael Kuhlman, um, that I know very well, and he's been doing research for the last 25 years in the Nanakwa region. So the, the sort of the co-evolution is taken a bit further because um, the Diasia floribunda is one of the species that actually produces oil. So the bee comes and actually takes its front legs, put it into the spurs where, where the fine hairs on the front legs wraps the oil blend and sucks it up. And when it takes up the front legs, it wraps it on the thorax and transfer the oil and then visit the next plant. So the bee actually collects oil and then 
it uses some of the oil to waterproof the nest because now their life cycle is similar to that of the of the flowers in the area so that means that um, these bees will only reemerge next season so what the bee does it uses some of the oil to waterproof the nest so the the, the hind legs are adapted as little sort of brushes so it lines the whole nest with um, with oil to waterproof it because the the next generation will only emerge after the next rainy season and then some of the oil is also used to make a little pollen balls um, to preserve um, as food for the next um, generation before they emerge and then there's also very very specialized um, uh, pollinators like um, this little fly here and as you can see they have co-evolved over the years so that the fly and the different species that it um, pollinates um, actually can coexist um, this fly is called um, prosuka marinasi and it actually pollinates about five different um, species in the Liverpool area. And it's also unique to the area with the long um, stems. So in the picture, we have um, Leperusia oreogena. And uh, the, the picture on the far right, you can see that the plant actually have little arrows pointing inward, showing the fly here. Because you can imagine if the fly needs to maneuver itself to actually find that little hole to suck, suck out the bot from the bottom of the of the tube, it needs to be very accurate. So the picture on the on the left, um, it actually took me about an hour to take that photograph, and um, they're very very difficult to photograph. It's easier to make a video of them. Um, so you will also notice that there's pollen on the front head of, of the fly. So the different species that this fly pollinates have the pollen presenters on different parts of the plant. So that also helps um, to exclude um, cross-pollination with um, different species. And yeah, the fly is very fast and also it emerges and it's synchronized with the different times that uh, the different species um, flower that it that it pollinates. So uh, a few years ago, I was honored um, by um, the person that described the, the fly and it was named after me and it's um, mainly because I had a sort of uh, obsession with the fly. I photographed it on every uh, one of the species that it it pollinates, and um, I've also done quite a bit of um, research contribution towards the description of the fly. So just a, a final note on the Vesca's Prize outing to Darling on the 17th of September at 10 a.m. Thank you. Eugene, thank you so much. There are a few questions for you. Do you mind uh, responding? If you don't mind leaving your camera on. <laughs> okay. So I'm the first ready. question. Yes. You ready? Your first yes. question is, um, how does one book a tour with you to go into the field to see the pollinators? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah all my details are, on the first slide and on the last slide and uh, people can feel free to, to contact me it's best to put me on whatsapp or, or just drop me an email okay fantastic um i even want to see it so my uh, my question is you said you waited an hour for that one pollinator but what is the longest you've ever sat crouching ready to capture them and got it or given up what is the longest you've sat there waiting about two and a half hours. And, and that's the actual one on, the, on my first slide on, on the Babiana, the fly in the Babiana. That took me about two, two and a half hours. 
and despite your really weird obsession with flies let's just say that <laughs> your flower your pictures are absolutely beautiful what kind of camera do you use um, most of those pictures were taken with my, my cell phone. Um, I've got an iPhone, so some of them have been taken, but also not a fancy camera. It's a cyber soft that I use, and mostly my, my camera and my phone these days, because it's um, high risk to walk in the town by yourself with an expensive camera. So, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I know Rupert always wants to um, talk to us about trespassing. You know, really, there's so many open spaces. I've recently just been in Wayland's, um, just before Darling, and it's beautiful in Tinny Fashfield. There's lots to see. I saw many of the flowers you were mentioning, and so it really isn't necessary to climb a farmer's fence and risk getting uh, into that kind of trouble. And no, then my last right. question yes. that I see there is for you, but finish speaking, Eugene. Yeah, it's rather be safe than sorry. Yeah. Um, and please don't dump fences. Please respect people's privacy. It was quite lovely. I actually met John Duckett walking his own Wayland's Nature Reserve. And it was the way he came up to me and said, I hope you're enjoying the flowers. And I took a look and I said, who am I speaking to? It's no John Duckett. And then he drove off in front of us, except he didn't drive off. He kept stopping to get out his car, but it's a one way to take photos. So we kept pumping out the car to follow him to see what was he looking at in his own felt? It was a really amazing experience. So pop into Wayland's. It's beautiful at the moment, really beautiful. And he said it's still actually a bit early. And you might find uh, John Duckett there with his camera guiding to you to all the, the red data species that he has. The guy's a rhizo and he has a sparaxis um, or a rubulia. That's also red data. So Eugene, last question that's been asked is um, what pollinator or which flowers pollinator or which flower are you still trying to capture? Which is the elusive one you're still hunting for? Um, yeah, I don't have an elusive pollinator. Um, okay, I actually do. I haven't got a nice shot of the red of pollinating the diaceas. That's the one because they much faster than the flies. You might need something more than a cell phone. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely fabulous and all the trouble and effort it takes to put a presentation together. And then I still limited your time. But I love the fact that you've said, get out and look between the daisies. And having just driven uh, through the wildflowers twice, there have been sections of the road where I've like, mm, I've seen everything and then I've stopped for something particular. And then I've just noticed so much more at my feet so if i could also encourage people to stop as often as possible whenever you see a really full patch of flowers because it's quite astonishing what you see between the daisies so thank you eugene it's been a pleasure having you please stay on if you'd like to thank you then i am going to just introduce uh jason sampson but first i just wanted to say that the whole idea of the spring the two spring webinars is to crisscross the country so we've done eugene at the west coast which of course at this time of year sings so loudly for all our south african hearts for these carpets of daisies but that's not to say that there isn't some spectacular spring flowers to be seen in the high felt along the east coast or even inland so next month we'll be having uh, an east coast speaker namama may from Kulefa Garden, and we'll be having Ndomiso Majiga from um, Lumpentain Botanical Garden sharing their plant passions and, uh, and flowers that they are enjoying and events in the area. So Jason is the curator of the Marnie van Escafe Botanical Garden in the Plant and Sciences, Sciences Department. His foraging garden and the future African, of the future African campus, my apologies, was his brainchild as an important part of the living plant collections at the University of Pretoria. Um, he holds a BSc degree and honours degrees, but really I met Jason over aloes. He is passionate. I'm hoping it's going to be more than aloes tonight, just to tease him. But I met him um, in the Marnie Funescafe Garden, walking along this long row 
of a variety of aloes that made me look twice. I'm not, it's not a great time to fish, not all that fond of succulents. So they have to be spectacular to win me over. And Jason's were. So Jason, welcome over to you. I'm looking forward to what you're going to share in the hard vault. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I have the uh, distinct privilege of working in Pretoria. Um, I grew up in uh, Gauteng and I've spent um, all of my professional life working in the bushveld and in the grasslands of, of, of the interior of South Africa. I um, curate the University of Pretoria's bot botanical collections. And um, I spend a, a lot of time in the felt, although um, less than I would prefer. Uh, my part of the world is very special. Um, it's a transition zone between uh, the Bankenfeld and the um, the Bushveld, and um, it's a landscape that has been formed by exciting events over about the last three billion years. Um, normally, people think of of winter and early spring in the high felt as being a bit drab. It is nothing nothing of the sort. Um, the photograph is of myself standing on the uh, Machalisberg Ridge, um, it's the Dustport, the Dustport Ridge to my left, and nor right, Corpies Bushveld um, uh, in uh, in the distance to my right. The uh, the companion sitting on my shoulder is named Jewel. Um, Jewel enjoys walks in the felt on my shoulder. Um, Jewel is a black winged jardine and one of our companion birds. Um, pictured in the uh, in the photograph are two uh, plants that uh, form a very uh, uh, important uh, component of the crest of the Michalisberg, and that is on your left, um, a xerophyta species, xerophyta retinervus, um, specifically, uh, also known as a black stick lily. Uh, these plants um, occur on on um, very shallow soils and uh, rock pavement communities. They're resurrection plants, which means they can dry out and look dead and burn and be growing again within um, 24 to 48 hours of receiving water in summer. They are um, fascinating plants, very difficult to grow in, in cultivation. And uh, to your right, Allopeglerae, which is, which is restricted to the crest in the northern faces of the highest parts of the Michalisberg and one or two smaller populations to the south, always in high places, always facing north. It occurs in similar um, conditions to the zero, zero fighter, but it is an extreme succulent. It doesn't have strange adaptions to dry out. It just survives by um, uh, storing water. Um, and it is actually in flower at this time of the year. Um, we have a diverse aloe flora, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But um, the peak of our aloe season is past, but we have a number of spring flowering aloes. And they generally um, flower to set seed just before the rains. Um, our rain, our rainy season will be starting in October. Yeah. Um, pictured is a section of the Vitvatus Rump. So the Bankenfeld, Bankenfeld, uh, uh, it comes from an old Dutch word uh, meaning a uh, uh, desk felt or ridge felt. So. Um, it's defined by these open spaces uh, covered in grasslands with uh, with with uh, quartzite, generally quartzite um, ridges, although dolomite ridges also occur, um, generally uh, uh, marching sort of east-west. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> that gives you an entire mosaic of different, different um, microclimates, um, soils, aspects, um, there are caves in certain areas. Um, there are diff uh, uh, some uh, very different soils um, formed by quartzite, formed by dolomites. Um, I know patches, huge patches of ironstone and hematite, and th that that def often defines the flora. Um, uh, Kalkiaville, for instance, has got a, a specific flora known only as the silver flora because for some reason. Um, a, a large proportion of the plants have got glaucous leaves. Um, it's a small patch 
uh, just uh, just to the south of of um, um on a cocky oval, uh, a limestone hill or rather a dolomite hill. The cradle of humankind is also is also in the Bankenfeld. There's a very a very old um, uh, dolomites and three million year old caves. So this is this is this is the, this is a picture of my childhood. This is where I grew up. I used to spend my life in the felt. Um, and I grew up just outside the cradle of humankind. So, if you're talking about uh, about uh, or late winter and early spring flowers in in the Bakerfield, you talk about a few um, different groups of plants. Uh, my favourite are always the 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 um, the plants that one will find after fires. Or the plants that are have completed their life cycle just before winter had set in, um, and I will be starting their life cycle with the rains. So top left is is um, Tobachia uh, acuti loba, uh, a very uh, common resident in the grasslands of, of South Africa. They can have either sweet smelling flowers or um, extremely vile smelling flowers, and you'll only know if you smell them. Um, bottom left, um, Hypoxus African potato, very famous plant, um, many different species, all, all generally have yellow flowers, and you'll often find them flowering very heavily after fires, which are, of course, a, a, a defining characteristic of grasslands. Um, the fires keep trees out and uh, biodiversity high in the grasslands. Uh, next, uh, uh, going anti-clockwise, is um, a marama bean, Thylacema. It's related to Bahinia, but it is a, it is part of the underground flora or an under, underground mesophytex. Uh, uh, These will be flowering soon. Uh, they won't be necessarily in flower yet, but they are sprouting after the fires. Um, next one on is Cucumis metuliferous. If you run into these in the felt, they are bright orange by this time of year. They are getting ready to rot just before the rains. Um, they will then sprout and uh, uh, um, fruit again in the summer and then leave these persistent fruit over winter. This is a cucumber relative and the fruit is actually farmed in places like New Zealand under the name of kawana, kawana melon. I prefer them green. You cut the thorns off, you slice them up and they taste just like a sour cucumber. Fantastic. Fantastic wild fruit. Um, uh, bottom right is, is a dicoma. The flowers will be shedding their seeds. Also, just before just before the rains, the plants will probably be almost completely dried out and ready to be burned. The Eulophia orchid in the middle of the photo. And then I don't have such an interest in insects as our previous host, but you know, if you find um, colorful looking denizens of the felt, they they are always, it's always interesting to see what they're busy with. Um, a large part of our spring and early summer display on the high felt is formed by, by Erythrina lysistimon. Pictured is, is, is the normal red flowered form and a pink mutation. I have about nine different flower color mutations in the botanical collections at the university. It's something that I was briefly interested in. Um, it's nice. Uh, because erythrinas grow very easily from transients, so you can propagate these strange mutations um, quite easily. Um, what is interesting with these flower colored mutations of erythrina is the seed tends to be the same color as the flower. So everybody knows erythrina seeds are red, but in a pink flowered erythrina, the seeds are pink. I've got a yellow flowered erythrinas and the seed look like maize. So it's obviously the same genes are being co-opted for flower colors or being used for seed color. To your left is, is part of the um, underground forest that, uh, that some people describe as being um, an integral part of the grasslands of South Africa. That is Erythrina Zyra, uh, Pluchbreka. They will only start flowering in October, so I'm breaking the rules a little bit. But this is essentially a tree that's been driven underground by frost and drought. Um, the suffratex can, can weigh um, up to uh, a ton or so. Um, I've seen people try to dig them out before and relocate them. It, uh, the uh, Afrikaans common name is Pluchbreka because if you run into one of these with a plow, that's the end of the plow. Um, 
completely invisible in winter unless you see the uh, the dried leaves and um, and the seeds but the above ground parts normally burn off in the fires then of course your lilies a very loose group but uh, uh, Scodoxus punicius you find in in forested cliffs and ravines and cave mouths they are in full bloom right now uh, pictured is the normal red flowered form and then uh, var alba which is a a white a white mutation um, in the uh, botanical gardens collection. Of course, crinums, crinum macaweni, um, uh, crinum bulbispermum, uh, very um, uh, very prominent uh, along river courses and wet areas. Crinum compare, uh, crinum. Um, there are some crinum species also from the drier areas and in, in grasslands. Nephophia rupera. We have three or four species of Nephophia, Nephophia rupera will be flowering now in early spring, Gloriosa superba, although that's the wrong form of the species for this presentation. Normally, the Gloriosas I run into the felt are yellow, purely yellow. And of course, Xerophyta in flower again. The Xerophyta pictures were taken um, just outside of Cullinan after a big burn and an early rain. And the hillside was every every shade of white through to that uh, lovely um, uh, dark purplish shade. Yeah, Cherise mentioned one of my first and greatest loves is aloes. Um, we've come out of a very, very busy aloe season, um, but uh, in Gauteng, um, aloes that one might still see in flower, um, aloe mutabilis, top right. Some people consider this a form of aloe arborescence. It's a cremnophytic plant, tends to grow on the southern faces in the Michalisburg scarp faces and cliffs, cliff faces throughout um, Gauteng. Um, it's distinctive color, mutabilis, meaning changeable, turns red to yellow. Um, some of your later flowering forms are still in flower now. Allo Malathi, of course we know Allo Malathi. These are hunting form of Allo Malathi um, flowering on Gladfield main campus. Um, the subsequent um, flower racemes are, are meant to attract sunbirds. Sunbirds like to perch on the uh, uh, the flowers that they feed on. So we're just making our pollinators welcome. Um, of course, a lot of aloe species are in seed right now, and the seed will be ripening in October and in November, just in time for the rain. Aloe peglerae coming into bloom. Um, aloe castania, the chestnut aloe, that would be the brown flowered um, uh, 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 cattail sort of aloe. Um, to the to the right of Ella Peglerae. And of course, uh, there are stapeliates that one finds in many of the same habitats. Um, that is Stapelia leandotsi, um, a very smelly clone that I have. Of course, it's a carrion flower and it uh, attracts flies as a pollinator. That particular plant is in a pot and it gets moved around depending on whether it's flowering or not. Um, of course, uh, uh, the habitats are, are, are starting to green up. Um, water being a bit of a, a, a limiting factor um, at this time of year but of course our wetlands are, are bright green as they green up as soon as the temperatures start warming up um, the top is Nuchali uh, Varsarulia um, the pictured uh, wetland environment is the hot beer spray in Hatfield it's a it's a rehabilitation um, project on a section of river that flows through our um, sports campus um, and ginger lilies, uh, polygalas, and uh, myself with a couple of friends. Um, said friends tend to um, start arriving at about this time of year, um, and you, uh, they, they, as soon as they warm up, they um, reptiles are very good at regulating their own body temperature. So even large um, lizards like this rock monitor are very active this time of year, um, coming out of brumation, looking for food. And of course, our trees are bush felt trees, and um, trees are trees are very much a part of the high felt. Um, sometimes in protected areas, and sometimes in uh, sometimes planted. Um, and sometimes in, in places where fire has been excluded and they start actually um, becoming a, a canopy that, um, that transforms that section of grassland. So um, top left is the, is the bride of the bush felt, the Didropia, um, Dombea rotundi folia. They are coming into full spectacular bloom on the rocky high areas around Pretoria at the moment. Uh, the whole tree turns 
ice white. So unfortunately, it's a very short display. It only lasts a couple of weeks and then the flowers turn brown before the leaves um, might have something to do with the common name of the roll period. Bottom left is me cheating a little bit. Um, pink flower Dombeira tundifolia are common in certain areas of the northern bushveld. Um, that picture was taken around Nelspreit. That's one of the pinkest ones I've ever seen. Um, middle is is one of the Ochna species, um, uh, Lacabriac or Kolbach plain. Uh, bottom is tree fuchsia um, that has an edible fruit as well. Very popular with birds. Uh, bottom right is, is 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 something that you actually find um, growing in very disturbed areas, very sandy areas, uh, Dodonia, uh, sand olive. Um, sometimes one finds uh, trees with uh, very uh, reddish um, seeds, um, very showy. And top right is a Budlia species. Um, I was looking for a good photo Budlia salvifolia, but uh, that is a uh, one of the other species, but Budlia salvifolia will be uh, in full bloom very soon uh, and is in full bloom in some areas already. And uh, yeah, so um, as uh, Sharice mentioned, I do a lot of work with Alice. So my last slide is not the felt and it's 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 not the beautiful things you can see in the felt. It's just um, a few photos um, that I took in the botanical garden uh, this year. Um, and in years previous. And so just to give you an idea of what, what my midwinter actually looks like is bottom right. Um, thank you very much. Jason, thank you so much for that. Your, that last picture is absolutely spectacular. I remember walking that with you and just being blown away by the display that aloes can provide. And I've recently heard as well on a pollinator list of what feeds well, that aloes rank one of the highest for the nutritional value of their nectar and how many pollinators they feed. There was another reason for me to just pay them some respect, even though they're possibly not my favorite at first choice. I thought, wow, I didn't even realize there was a pollinator list ranking plants as to how well they can feed things. And kudos to Alice for doing that. You're just showing off of that last picture. It's absolutely brilliant. So I have two questions that have come through. How long will an aloe take from seed to being sown by seed and germinating to be ready to be plant, planted out in the garden? Is the growth rate of an average garden aloe? How long does someone have to wait? You know, it's it's a it's a relatively broad question, but normally aloes that do well in gardens are, are ready for planting out in gardens in about two to three years from seed. And then the rest of the question was, and then till flowering. Okay. Also, once again, a slightly unfair question. Smaller aloes flower <laughs> faster. Something like aloe molothi, you'll wait a good five to seven years to see a first flower. Um uh, where is something that is that is smaller, three to four years. Hybrid aloes tend to flower faster than species aloes. And also you do get like your habitat endemics. So for instance, aloe peglerae, which I, which I spoke about in the talk, that grows in what can only be described as extremely high silica sand with virtually no organic matter. And so why if you is want that? To grow, because, Sorry, the top, that? because the top of the Michalisberg is is recrystallized quartzite so it actually weathers into pool filter sand and that's what a lot of people use in their pool filters is quarried from areas in the Michalisberg. Mm -hmm. old quarries um the Michalisberg is a biosphere reserve but there are there are historical quarries that still quarry that material so if you want to grow allopeglare well you have to grow it in pool filter sand in a terracotta pot in the north face of your house and try not to let it get too wet in winter. And it'll flower every year for you. But if you were to plant it in your garden, it'll probably survive, but it'll never flower. Well, I thought aloes were easy. I thought you just, what, what's that thing about succulents? You just break it off and stick it in and it'll be fine. Now look at you making it all difficult for us and challenging us. Like South it. African flora, there's always an exception. That is true. That is true. And also for the uh, the viewers, uh, Jason kept referring to the rules. So I'm a I'm a tough cookie in some ways. 
And I made up a whole lot of rules that Eugene and Jason had to follow. First of all, uh, they had to show what was in flower now in their area, because I wanted you to be able to drive out or walk in the felt and actually see what they'd been speaking about. And the next rule was that they had to make sure that at least 70% of the plants they spoke about were available in your local nursery or online to buy seed. And the last unfair rule was to say that uh, the majority of the plants would need to be, you would be able to grow them. Because um, quite often, wonderful shows and displays and presentations on plants on things that you would never be able to get hold of or grow. And it's incredibly frustrating. So he was breaking the rules a few times, but it's still to come. So it's fine. It's not like you've missed it. It's, it's in the future. Thank you so much, Jason, for your time. I really appreciate it. I've loved the display from the high felt and I look forward to, because I actually originally asked you to show me what would be uh, between the daisies, so between the grasses in the grasslands. And of course, as a summer rainfall guy, you put me right and said, the grasslands are still dry and nasty. So I might ask you sometime in the future to show us a grassland talk if you're up for it. I did have one question from myself. And that is, you showed a picture of polygula, but I thought polygulas were only winter rainfall species. Um, are there summer rainfall species of polygula? Yeah, there are. There are a couple of quite uh, quite uh, widely um, distributed polygula. So uh, there was uh, a polygula vergata, which is the broom the broom polygula. Mm. They tend to, it's, it's, it is summer growing, tends to seed itself all over the place. And I think it actually has a range um, uh, uh, that extends um, north of South Africa. I had no idea. I, I've claimed that as a winter rainfall species. So lovely when I learn something. Look, there's a, there's a couple of genuses that are huge in the winter rainfall. And they only get a couple of them up in the summer rainfall. But I mean, Protea would be a great example. We, we, we've we only got three or four uh, protea species that I know of in, 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 in the half felt. And I mean, how many do you have? Well, I don't want to brag. <laughs> I'll give you your succulents and we'll keep our proteas. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. So everybody, what I've done is I've prepared what's on in and around the country as far as I could um, find. I'm just going to share my screen and go through a whole lot of events that you would be able to find uh, in your area. Just to make it work. It's perfect, Purix. Okay, can I get to the next slide though? Uh, just see this it, it, just to the right at the bottom these are these are, uh, uh, yeah there you are thank you so much all right so the first uh, is in Durban Botanical Gardens they have a plant fair also don't worry if you're not able to fast enough uh, or capture the details quick enough uh, we will be sharing uh, this as a pdf and then you'll be able to see all the details that you couldn't quick enoughly for oh, English you couldn't capture quick enough uh, but they're going to have an indigenous plant fair in Durban Botanical Gardens in September so diarize that uh, the Botanical Gardens plant fairs are always great because you get things you generally can't get hold of and I'm cheating a little and showing an October date for the Kirsten Bosch plant fair uh, that's building back uh, biodiversity in the garden so Kirsten Bush has always had their plant fair in autumn, but they're now going to be having one in spring. So you can diarize that. The low felt branch was great. Frank Webb shared a whole lot of um, activities that are going on there. Sunday, the 15th of October and Sunday, the 17th. Lovely things that the Botanical Society members of that branch get to do. I'm busy hunting for plants of Pavetta cuperi, so it immediately caught my eye. And then parks, the national parks are open for free, um, 16 to 24 September. What a joy to be able to go in without having to pay and enjoy our natural heritage all over the country. So remember to plan to make use of that.
And then, as Eugene mentioned, there's the Clan William Wildflower Festival, although I didn't want to focus too much on the West Coast, quite honestly, with this annual event of flowering. Um, what's spectacular this year is with the rains and the temperature is you're getting uh, bulbs, succulents, and the daisies in flower all at once. And they generally overlap, but in really, really good years, you get them all three blooming spectacularly together. And the felt is like that at the moment. It doesn't always happen. So if you could drive out any time during the week, it's quieter, but even on the weekends. And the Darling and the Clan William shows are really incredible because they go collect it all for you. And they put it on display so you could go to one church venue or the town hall and they have everything there and best of all it's usually labeled along with milk tat and cook sisters and local cuisine and this was quite interesting the darling wildflower show wanted um volunteers which is wonderful to go help pick and arrange and display and sue can be contacted if you would like to go put that show together and the Carlet Stork Fet Plant Fierce is uh, going to be happening soon. So that's something you can diarize as well for all those succulent lovers that I've offended this evening. There, I've made it up to you. Huntum National Botanical Garden is full of flowers at the moment. Please go support that botanical garden. And the Cape Horticultural Society, less botanical now, or it'd be a mix of indigenous and exotics. They are having their annual fundraising sale. That'll be happening on the 9th of December in Constantia. It's always a wonderful selection of plants grown by the Horticultural Society, so that you can contend to. The Fainbos Life Fair, Caitlin is uh, very set on endemic local sand plain Fainbos that's threatened and not just grows locally. That's where the city of Cape Town was built, is on this vegetation type. And she is doing a lot to protect it and promote it. So again, you'll find really unusual plants at this fair. Guerland Fig Plant Fierce, hosted by Living Desert Plants. Uh, they have really unusual succulents that you can't generally get hold of in the nurseries. That's always well worth it. There is so much to do. And then I found something on Shuttle Bora. It's gone quiet. But you all need to be paying attention to what's happening around Shothole Bora. And Francois Roots had uh, an amazing talk that I attended, giving the story of the fungus, not just the beetles. I highly recommend joining the Pathology <laughs> Society. Um, all about plant pathology. So interesting. All the things that viruses, bacteria and fungi that we don't usually look for. We're so busy looking at the pests that we can see. We forget there's a whole world going on with plants that is unseen to our eye. We only ever see the symptoms. Um, and so it could be very interesting for you to join the society or ask to attend his talk in particular as a visitor. Quite out of interest, any wildflower photography it has a really good uh, charity that it's supporting. It's local. I thought I would give this show a mention. And then back to Kuzulu Natal. Uh, they are having a wonderful clivia show and sale. Amazing colors and varieties and breeding going there. And then I am hosting a propagation workshop this Saturday at the Flower Cafe, propagating streptocarpus, which are indigenous to South Africa, made famous by Dibleys in Wales and at the Chelsea Flower Show. But they really are our plants to be celebrated as well. And the fun thing about them is they're done by leaf cuttings. So if you would like to join me, you can book through the Flower Cafe and I'll see you this Saturday. And then a wonderful celebration is with the Vuerde Fierce that's going to be happening in Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch Botanical Gardens is now going to have its first rare and collectible plant market. And they'll be hosting a whole lot of events and workshops as well. So that is definitely one to attend. Something new and exciting, something different, and another little botanical garden that's absolutely exquisite and well worth a visit if you've never been. And that is it from me. Are there any questions from anybody? Yeah. 
Let me just check. All right. Well, everyone, with three minutes to spare, if I have done the job well, just looking for the Q&A section. There we go. Thank you for joining me in my first Botanical Society webinar, where we are learning to know, grow, enjoy, as well as protect our Indigenous flora. I look forward to seeing you. Oh, Mary, yes, a question. What would you like to ask, Mary? Will there be a replay? That can't be Mary's question. Madeleine, are you able yes. to help me? Yes, we are going to upload it on the YouTube channel of Botsok. Uh, and we've recorded it. Thank you. Mary from Blumenstein raised a hand. Are you able to see what she would like to ask? Uh, she must just put something in the chat. I don't know if she wants to talk. I think it's perhaps an accidental hand. All right, Mary, if you still have a question, just click on the chat link at the bottom of the Zoom and you can type out a question from us. There is a, a question now. She's asking, when is the Stellenbosch Garden event? Stellenbosch Garden event? Well, that event is in October. Um, we can go back and have a look at it, but we will be sharing the PowerPoint. I'm just able to go back if you want to see 14th to 15th of October uh, is that particular rare and collectible plant market the word of yes I think is for the entire week so there it is so both the powerpoints are now in the chat I'll keep the room a little bit open uh, but we can also put it um, when we distribute we'll add it in you'll be getting the information um all of you who participated you're welcome to share it um my powerpoint of all the events around cape town um and across the rest of the country and thank you so much i'll hang around just a little bit but if you are ready to leave that's absolutely fine